Well, we hope that everybody listens to the earbuds uh, at every opportunity, but we've got to pause now to recognize and talk about the the salute to the immortals, the pantheon of the legends that is the WWE Hall of Fame ceremony. And the first thing I've got to say is, and I don't think this is an inflammatory comment, don't they need to move this to SummerSlam or some other place? It's got lost now. When it was its own event, even in an arena, but it was the only thing of the night, and, you know, everybody came dressed up, and they had the red carpet, and they had time for the speeches, and a blah, blah, blah. Except for that, that year, they did it for TV and tried to have the funks do a five-minute acceptance speech, right? But when it was his, its own event... It felt like something, but now they start at, at 10, 15 Eastern or whatever after they've revamped the the set. They're streaming it on Peacock. But it, it they weren't done till after midnight in that building that had already seen two hours of wrestling. And the guy, it, you know, at midnight, I don't care who it is talking. You know, when giving acceptance speeches or induction speeches or whatever, there's got to be an element of, boy, I'd enjoy this a lot more at 9 p.m., isn't there? Is this too late? Is it just being sandwiched in? Now, again, it used to be one of the regular features of WrestleMania weekend, then they added a second night of WrestleMania, so it throws off everything. And then they added NXT. And And they've added a lot of shit. And I mean, unless they're going to back up to Thursday night or something, I don't know. I think the bigger issue is just the fans there. You know, they're not necessarily the fans that wanted to attend the Hall of Fame ceremony. And I think you want to have that as an event. Why not have that? You're in the business of selling tickets. That's something that you'll be able to sell tickets to. Yeah, it's a separate, separately ticketed event that used to be and and is still waiting to happen. But and the, like you said, the audience is different because all of the the people were polite, for the you know in places where a more typical northeast crowd may not have been so polite, but they were the fly-ins and they they respect everybody. But it got late at night once that Heyman was done. And they had to put a Heyman on, they had to Saturday night's main event the thing and put the main event on first because you're fighting sleep. So, boy, there was, you know, after, and how do you follow Paul speaking, doing anything, right? So, anyway, that's what I'm saying, is that this, I I think if they're going to do it and give everybody a, a chance to enjoy it, maybe spread it out a little bit take it out of WrestleMania and put make it the attraction of SummerSlam weekend or one of them. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, Jackie Redmond and Corey Graves were the host. She may be the best on-air female talent that the host, a now, a interviewer, whatever that they've got. And Graves is doing great stuff. He's quick. You so know what my favorite it, thing about her is? Whenever what? they go to her in the back, and again, these backstage vignettes or interviews have been so much better lately. Whenever they go to her, she says, thanks, Cole. <laughs> not Michael Cole, or not Michael. Thanks, Cole. Thanks, Cole. Uh, but, of course, they led with, you know, Paul, because it's Philadelphia, and and also, again, by the time he's going to be finished, it's going to be after 11 o'clock. They didn't want to put Paul out there at midnight. It still would have been good, but that wouldn't have been fair to him. And, uh, you know, they he a great history package, those old pictures. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, what do you, was it ECW or WWE that aged him so horribly, do you think? I think it was life. <laughs> It's just a question of life. But anyway, so uh, Paul, that's the thing. You could tell by that, uh, the the, most of the video package that they did, he does nothing fake or eye-winky. He's always who he's supposed to be. He only interacts with top main event talent. Everything he's involved in makes sense. He has a completely unique personality and delivery. 
And he never does or says anything that Paul Heyman wouldn't do or say on television. So, you know, you can make the case that I talk about Gunther being a perfect wrestler, but you can make a case that Paul has taken care of himself. Because, I mean, at some point or another, every member of the talent roster has had to, for whatever purpose, do something really fucking stupid. Right? Who can you think of besides Paul that hasn't done something really stupid or phony or eye rolly or whatever? I can't think of it. I mean, there's certain things he's done that's made me roll my eyes. I can't say that. <laughs> well, but, <laughs> yes, but not in a like not that. in a like, you know, they're out there that he's scrambling for the 24-7 title, or you know what I'm saying. No, he stays away from embarrassing shit, whether it's running TNA or being involved. I mean, there's very few people for a little while. He's involved with like Ryback and unfortunately uh, Kurt Hennig's son who never had a good name. It was Michael McGillicuddy, then Curtis Axel. That was the only weird period where it was like, what are they doing with Heyman? Other than that, the people he's with has always been the right. I mean, he managed Sabu when Sabu was the indie darling. He managed... You know, everyone at the right time, it seems like. But anyway, he's a very, very smart fella. Visually repulsive, but a smart fella. Anyway, so Roman inducted him, talked about the inspirational things that Paul has taught him, and was very heartfelt in that. And he always knows what... I thought it was kind of... Good Lord, there's a fucking sports car going by here. One of those goddamn hot rodders. Oh, what if it's the fabulous ones? I thought it was a vroom vroom. It was the thrill seekers. I thought that uh, it was telling well, that Roman. Oh, wow. Yeah, that Roman says he always tells you what you need to hear. And sometimes it may have an element of what you want to hear, but that's he's a great motivator. But it, and he said he's a he's a minch. Brian, is that uh, that's good, right? That's like the ultimate compliment, yeah. Well, there you go. I didn't know they had menches in Samoa, though. <laughs> I think you could be a mensch anywhere. They just may call it something else. Ah. Well, then he, he, Roman introduced him, and Paul waddled out proudly and hugged Dreamer and RVD and Bubba and Roman and, of course, then gets away with cussing, but they're bleeping on Peacock! Uh... I thought that they could get away with a few things on the streaming, but apparently they even bleeped shit. But nevertheless, um, we finally saw members of his family. His kids were there. And when I've heard him talk about his children, I was thinking children, but they're didn't they look kind of college age, 18, 20, thereabouts, something like that? You're a better judge than I am. Well, if you think about it, when he had kids... That was 20 years ago, give or take. I'm, how time flies when you're not paying attention to other people's business. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they're, they're, they're fine and all grown up. She's attractive. He looks scared shitless, the young man. But I wonder... Will you since, leave them alone? What is your problem? <laughs> well, no, he, lo he, looked like, he looked like he was... The, his son looked like he was scared there, like he's got the perma grin on his face, like they're shooting me on camera. But she's attractive. I wonder if Paul should have a DNA test. Will you, again, will you leave him alone? That, We're well, talking about his Hall of Fame yes, induction. Did a wonderful job. Um, he should run for office. He put Triple H over. He put Stephanie over. He talked in a heartfelt manner to his children and gave them a pep talk about not giving up on their dreams referenced wishing that his mother and father were here to see it, wished Dusty was here to, to see it, said that directly to Cody. Somebody in the crowd chants, or didn't chant, yells, we love you, Paul, and he says, I love me too. Um, and he, he's, he's, he stole a, a page from my book of uh, philosophies, Brian, because he had an old cardboard box there, and he pulled out his leather coat and headset from ECW and his hat, Right out of that old box, and the people cheered, which proves that anything that comes out of a box gets over. And he did his ECW segment, and 
you know, rah rod that because that's it's Philly and that's what that segment of the audience came to hear. And he said, if you think ECW died in bankruptcy court in 2001, you can suck my dick. I have a feeling he even Paul might have asked if he could say suck my dick. They bleeped it, of course, but I think he probably asked on that. He should have done a Thunderbolt Patterson. You could suck my ow. You could eat my. <laughs> so no, he was gonna eat there. Yes, well, and, then they, and then we could eat each other's. <laughs> but anyway, um, he, Paul, in in of course, in his own fashion, took credit for everything he's ever done. And then said, when he was swimming in the ocean of obscurity, he was rescued to the island of relevancy by Roman Reigns and. Did you notice when Paul, when he closes his eyes, I've never seen this before, his eyelids are wrinkled. Did you see that? No. What I've you, never what seen are you a human. About? He's, he, when he closed his eyes, his eyelids are wrinkled. I can't even tell if you're fucking with him again or I'm, this is really an observation I'm, this that you have. It's a real observation. <laughs> if you go back and look, Paul Heyman, when he closes his eyes, his eyelids are wrinkled. Anyway, so then. He talked about the new stars and who got mentioned first, Braun Breaker and Rhea Ripley. He he knows, he knows. He you might see if if he lives long enough, next year or two, you might see him with Braun Breaker, I bet you. And then he still he has that volume in his voice where he can turn that boomingness on and I'm thinking it's kind of like you know, Aretha Franklin, the bigger she got, the more power she could get out of her, her lungs. <laughs> so <laughs> It's nothing like that. And by the way, she had a very powerful voice when she was not as large as she would be. As become. large and in charge. But no, the, you, can you think about it? You're talking about a Campbell soup can or you're talking about a big old barrel drum. That barrel drum's going to have more resonance and depends what else is in the drum if the drum is filled well, up with lard it for instance it looks like that drum is filled with lard but uh, anyway he said i'm blown up and i have to pee and and finished with we're going to disrupt the industry all over again and, and that was a 50 minute segment how paul again has the energy and that with that the state of his physical condition i'm i'm proud for him that was a but the best speech that has ever been at the Hall of Fame, I think, and obviously what the people came to see. Really good speech. For me personally, like some of the parts like about being canceled, that was kind of cringy and, you know, I don't well, know. Well, but but he's got he builds everything up to he can read you the phone book as they say or he can you know, read mundane things, but in the dramatic manner that he builds everything. How do you think he's been able to talk all these people into doing all the stupid things they've done for him over the years? Well, there's also a lot of stupid people. Well, that's that helps, but but no, you've still got to be good. Well, what I was going to say before... Uh, you, you see, you drag me into what you do to him. <laughs> just what you slandering him. And <laughs> putting and the guy over his thing. thing. The greatest talent in the goddamn business. Go ahead. Uh, it was a good speech. He came out. He saw some of the old ECW guys. I saw a comment online that made me laugh. They said he patted down Tommy Dreamer to make yeah. sure. Because Tommy Dreamer previously said, you know, Paul Heyman cost me everything. I was going to shoot him at WrestleMania. Yeah. Well, when Tommy went through that period of cloudy thinking there, he was going to hop the rail at WrestleMania and shoot Paul and himself and make history. But I, I guess he changed his mind and he hugged him instead. The biggest issue, I guess, I mean, Heyman's so smart. Thank God he went on first, because I don't even know if he would have been able to get the same energy if he had gone on after everyone else or any of the other people at all. Yeah. But starting the show with Heyman was a good idea. Well, then we went, after Happy Heyman, our friend and colleague, we went to Bull Nakano being inducted by Medusa. Or Alundra Blaze, as they still call her there. For she was Alundra Bra Alundra Braze. Yeah, Dairy Queen Brazier. She was Alundra Bra I can't. What is wrong with you? She was Alundra she Blaze. She was a Alundra Blaze for like a year and a half and has been Medusa for the rest of her life, and they're still calling her Alundra Blaze. 
I think Medusa's great. Bull Nicano is great. This is a two and a half hour show. And it's not that I'm not interested in women. I'm not particularly interested in this particular woman. Sherry Martell, check. Leilani Kai, Judy Martin, check. Uh, whatever, but... Um, Medusa, random thoughts on what I did watch. Medusa looks fantastic. Uh, as soon as she started talking about Bull Nakano's dreams and aspirations at the age of 15, I hit fast forward. I came because there's no visual fast forward on the... On the peacock. So I was having to kind of just gauge it, but I jumped back in on Bull Nakano's entrance. She's lost a considerable amount of weight, has she not? She has. It was, she looked very svelte and, and demure and fa looks fantastic for her age, which apparently they said was 56. And then she started talking. And it sounded like she was going to be nice to people and talk for a while, so I hit fast forward. That's rude. And when I came back, I was in the middle of the Becky Lynch and Rhea Ripley video, which was dynamite, by the way. But what, if anything, did I miss about uh, Miss Nakano's in induction here? Well, you shouldn't call it dynamite. That's not necessarily a compliment anymore. Ah, uh, that's true. It was a very nice speech. It went on for a while. Uh, Asuka... Seemed emotional listening to it. Bull Nakano was really good, and it was even cool because they showed some of the footage they had of her, I think from like 86, when her and Dump Matsumoto came over and worked some dates for the WWF. You know, people almost think it's like nothing and then the Jumping Bomb Angels. They were there in 86, and it was really cool. Really cool to see. I liked it. Well, good, but here's what was really cool to see is the fucking video between Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch, the WrestleMania match promotional video. And again, next level television production on this thing. And what I talked about a few weeks ago, the whole mommy and the man deal, this is a money match in the women's division in anybody's, anybody's little black book. And uh, Jim, then, can, can we take a break for a moment? Um, I have a few things I want to cut into the show with, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll go right ahead. One, tying into this story, and Paul Heyman specifically, because VCW, WWE wasn't the only company putting a Hall of Fame together. The Indie Wrestling Hall of Fame took place. Oh, boy. Game Changer Wrestling promoter Brett Lauderdale had to announce on Twitter. Let me read this tweet to you. In the true spirit of independent wrestling, Sabu has decided to keep his deposit and no-show the Indie Hall of Fame ceremony today. <laughs> he accepted the booking and took the money, but doesn't want to get in the elevator and come upstairs. What? What a legend. <laughs> doesn't want to get in the elevator and come upstairs. That's a new one. Not he won't get in the car and be driven to the show. He won't come upstairs. But that's uh, the other Hall of Fame, Sabu. I guess he's still... In is he inducted if he doesn't show up? I don't... Well, it depends on where his car is parked. Unless, unless there's goddamn a stairway he can take, he might not be able to get back to his car. Well, that's that news. And then here's other news. Elevator phobic. Sabu. This may excite you a little bit more. There is news going around right now, Jim. And even the Observer is now reporting it. Jacob Fatu has informed people that he has signed with WWE. Boom! Boom! Now we're going to see some shit. Now something's going to happen. The werewolf will be on the prowl. Oh, werewolves of WWE. Oh. What? No. <laughs> What? That sounded so awful. It's so out of tune. It has nothing to... Whatever. Jacob Fatu, what do you think? Well, I just said I'm howling over the news. What do you think this means for tonight? Uh, well... Could this mean something for WrestleMania as we are recording? Would you do well, that right away, or do you send them to NXT to work his way up? Well, no, you don't do either, I don't think, because Cody pretty much needs to win tonight. And you don't debut a, a new 
secret weapon in a losing effort, but I don't think that the people in NXT should see him. I think he should make some kind of impact by possibly on the Raw after WrestleMania by fucking doing one of those goddamn moonsaults at his goddamn look off the top and squashing somebody or another one of those awesome things he can do and surprise everybody right off the bat. But that's, that's just me. If you do something where Cody beats Roman, you know, kind of like when Shawn Michaels lost the belt and DX had to retool, the next night is when Shawn Waltman debuted. Yeah. If you do something like that, the next night you have a new member of the bloodline, which needs a new member badly. Yeah, this this guy could come in and goddamn, oh shit, they let him out. He's out, he's free, doesn't have a bracelet on, shit, we're all in trouble. The previous management refused to even negotiate with him. Yes. But he is somehow here now, unchained. Well, I know how, because his fucking cousin's on the board of directors. Boom! That's a, a, Boom! Boom! They, th- this guy's gimmick is that nobody would touch him because of how dangerous he is in his background, and he's a threat to society, but goddamn Rock's gonna let him loose on us because he's pissed. The Rock has Woo. to go make a movie. Who's gonna be there in his stead tearing things up? Jacob Fatu. You never know what might happen. Hey, Jim, one more thing, because this is fascinating, and it's uh, something people are talking about as we do this real-time, real-world update here in the show. Is is this the real... Is this real life? A statement from Michael A. Monteforte, or Montefort. I really don't know how to... What, What does Mr. Fortunato have to say? Michael A. The middle initial makes it classy. Michael A. Monteforte posted on Instagram... This is Vince McMahon's personal trainer. Oh, boy! Vince McMahon was unable to attend his first WrestleMania. How quickly people forget that without his vision, there would be no wrestling or WrestleMania. He invented both. Sadly, when a person is down, the people who say they love you turn their backs on you. Don't judge a man. Without getting all the facts, things aren't always as they appear. Oh, so this uh, Michael Monteforskew, Monteforskin, Montefuscu, Montefalco, he knows some, Monte, Monte Crisco, he knows some things that he's not saying. You know, and that's the thing, that is true. When a man's down, it's terrible for people to just. While he's down, just shit on him like that. <laughs> you, you know what? You're, <laughs> you're out of control, first of all. I like this little insight, though, into Vince's inner circle. First of all, it shows that Vince is upset that some people haven't stood by him. That he invented wrestling, let alone WrestleMania. But also, who's he hanging out with? His assistant and that other executive who are brothers that work for him. The chef. The chef. The chef. The, is this the personal trainer now, or is this who was who was involved in the head shitting incident? Was that was that a, a physical personal, therapist. No, a that physical, was a physical therapist. therapist. So they, they, they couldn't be. It might not be Michael A. Monte Cristo here, it because he's a personal trainer, not a physical therapist. Does it say anything to you though that this is the person putting out a defense events right now? He surrounded himself with people that are, I've said, Vince is Trump if he was articulate. He surrounds himself with stooges and sycophants that tell him how great he is, and then he demands that his, you know, Miss Grant there, whatever his relationship could have been called with her, write letters glorifying that he hung the sun and the moon and stars. He lost his fucking mind. Do you think the personal trainer gets a $50 bonus? Only if he gets color. Well, Jim, let's uh, return to the Hall of Fame. Back to the Hall of Fame, because speaking of real Hall of Fame talent, I'm glad to see that finally an omission has been rectified and clarified and circumcised or whatever, because it just wasn't fair that all the great contributions that Muhammad Ali made to the world of sports, that he he maybe was in some little rinky-dink Hall of Fames, 
But now he's enshrined in a major Hall of Fame, Muhammad Ali, into the WWE Hall of Fame. <sighs> I'm from Louisville. And, I, and we, we love Muhammad Ali. But, uh, and I mean, it, it, yes, he did do the first WrestleMania as the referee or blah, blah, blah. But he was a wrestling fan. They showed the clips, and I, I, we see all the Ali documentaries here in Louisville, and they never show his wrestling clips. So it was nice to see that stuff. But uh, you know, this was for publicity, was it not, if, if really nothing else? And WWE has some sort of merchandising or marketing agreement with him because they put out different action figures with him within the last year, 18 months, and they're about to put out more. So, well, that, that there may be a clue as to what's going on with this timing. Um, did you see in the package that Hogan always said, hey, I'd go up to Muhammad Ali and say, you're the greatest. He said, no, you're the greatest. Hulk Hogan, you're the greatest. Hulk, Hulk Hogan, Hogan, you're the greatest of all time. I love you, Hulk Hogan. Uh, but, they, uh, but anyway, they had The Undertaker to induct him. And Taker's clearly a fan, and he loves combat sports and you know legends like that that was his era like mine when we were kids he also needs to just shave his head well it is getting thin up there but, i don't know what the hell was going on up there um but a heartfelt speech and then he introduced alani ali to accept i'm sure i'm sure she was thrilled of all the many honors that uh have come their way, but they bleeped the F when she said WWF as it was known then. It happened a few times. I think it happened with uh, Wyndham and Rotunda, too. Can they not even say that now, as in, like, referring to the past, a historical fact that was accurate? And That's crazy. You're talking about history. I mean, that's the thing. You're yeah. talking about actual history. So, it anyway. Was, this was, this, this whole thing was the most bizarre segment. Undertaker coming out there. And not like, uh, you know, Mom, <laughs> just, hey, this is Mark, friendly Mark out here. Talking about how much he loves Ali, there's no connection with The Undertaker and Muhammad Ali at all. The Undertaker had no connection. The Undertaker gives the speech. They bring up Ali's wife. And I know Ali was married a few times, I believe. But she goes, I knew Muhammad since I was six. Yes. And I'm like, what? Well, that that did require a bit more explanation, and I'm, we don't have the time, and I'd have to refer to one of my books, but the, the, this was one of Ali's later wives, and they had not been romantic since they were six, but because he was a celebrity even at that point, she had met him as a child. Is what, but right. which would have it was not phrased that nice, way. It was <laughs> yeah, it would have been a nice sounding story if she'd have you know, but but yeah. Anyway, and the point then, it when she accepts, she then presents the Rock with a championship belt for the People's Championship because the story was, and when he comes out, she calls him out. The crowd mildly kind of booed him. And he gave an acceptance speech of the title belt that she gave him and putting Ali over, obviously, but said the Ali family came to a show in Louisville and authorized him to call himself the people's champion when he was with the nation during the Attitude Era. In Louisville? You, do you remember this? I don't remember that. I'm not saying he never <laughs> met with them. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Hold on. Because he was with the nation. He was done with the nation by what? The beginning of 99, right? Well, you know, they did a couple of uh, pay-per-views in Louisville in, uh, in uh, I think it was 97 and 98, I believe. Um, I didn't even think, you know, the whole ridiculous thing that happens here. I didn't even think about the idea of the rock lied about the story of meeting Ali in Louisville. Well, no, he never said he met Ali because Ali, he said Ali's family. And Ali, oh, that's Ali right. does have family that that's do right. live here. So, point, and they may have even come to the matches. I'm not saying, but I don't know if there was a concerted, you know, contingent from the Ali family that came in to have this summit meeting with The Rock about, but nevertheless. Um, and he said, you know, he said, yeah, they told me that Muhammad said you're okay to do it. But so anyway, you've got. 
The Rock accepting an award from the wife of Muhammad Ali, who's being inducted into their Hall of Fame. And I'm I'm starting to get with you. It's like uh, we're getting a little a, a lot of rock here in a little short period of time. Hey, listen, it's not even her presenting him with a belt. What does she know? The belt makers? How did she get a belt? How come the belt has the WWE <laughs> logo on it? What the hell was it? Was this even really Ali's wife? Was any of this no, real? No, no, no. That, that was... was any of this real? Did any of this happen? It was uh, It was there. Yes, yes, it was there. Come on. The belt had um, the logo on it. Who does she know? She's not calling Dave Milliken. Hello, this is Muhammad Ali's wife. I need a belt for the real people's champion. No, she had it made in Pakistan. It was cheaper that way. Come on, what was that? He presented no. himself with a belt. My man over at Main Event Belts in, in the UK. He presented himself with a belt. <laughs> that was a Vince oh. McMahon did that once. He presented himself with a giant plaque to celebrate the sales of the <laughs> WrestleMania VHS at the Garden. Made his own plaque, gave it to himself. <laughs> this is what The Rock did. He got a belt and gave it to him. He had Muhammad Ali's wife give it to him. By the way, I accept the lineage of the people's champion that it was uh, Bruno San Martino. And well, and by the way, yes, the people's champion, and the people's champion is not a new phrase in wrestling, which is kind of where The Rock got it. But also, I would say, oh, you're just making too much of this. You're just going on and you're winding everybody up for no reason. But The Rock brought the belt out at WrestleMania the next night and held it up like he was still a WWF champion. <laughs> Uh, again, that's the so, thing. If you really believe she presented it, that means you think somehow she got this belt made with WWE logos on it. <clears throat> I mean, who thought it was a good <throat> idea to do this? How is this a good <throat> idea? Hey, the Ali family has a reach far and wide. They know jewelers everywhere. All right, can we move on now? Even the got, fans were like, what the fuck? Shot. Even the fans were like, what the fuck? He walked through the crowd. He came through the crowd you, out of nowhere gotta, to accept this. You got another clear shot at the rock here at the end. So save something. Because I want to get to Wyndham and Rotunda so we can get past Wyndham. And, no, uh, Barry Wyndham and Mike Rotunda, the U.S. Express, both Hall of Fame wrestlers for this team, as we've talked about, I'm not sure. And they had a bunch of... Of the talking heads talk about how they revolutionized. Did they revolutionize anything? Were they? Did we establish they weren't there a year? The video basically was all around them being a part of WrestleMania 1. And really, that is kind of their biggest legacy in WWE. They were great and probably would have kept going if Barry hadn't decided to quit. Uh, which and I, I mean, think, the, which the, I think the, according the, to Barry, happened after Mike quit. And then when Barry quit, Mike had already gone back. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they were they teamed some in florida also but it wasn't like you know the point is barry windham as a single wrestler definitely hall of fame guy barry windham and ronnie garvin were a very successful tag team as people may remember mike rotunda and rick steiner were a great team rotunda wasn't bad as irs on his own but just this team but anyway then they, they did also there's a tie-in there is the new bray wyatt documentary that's out they had um taylor and micah rotunda mike's sons uh or the son and son son and daughter and acknowledge bray who was the other son and mike looks great he always stays in shape barry is not as big as i'd seen him in the past i think he's lost a little weight uh he's got some more to go and th this was the thing is <sighs> Mike was never an animated public speaker, and he did most of it. Barry chimed in every once in a while, and it was already midnight. And so they were polite to him, but I think they probably, the people would have enjoyed it more if it had been earlier in the festivities. And they honored Bray with the, the cell phone lights, and everybody held their, their phones up and they played the music. But, uh, Nice, nothing, nothing revolutionary here on this induction. Yes. <laughs> Mike Rotunda looks like uh, Chandler from Friends if he had grown up right. Yes, if, he, if he'd grown up and stayed away from bad habits. That's right. And that's what, Mike looks like a, a fucking IRS guy to this day rather than a wrestler. You know, I remember his promos as Captain Mike. <laughs> Uh, both versions, the uh, wrestling team captain and also the yacht captain. 
My different versions of Mike Rotunda, and of course, his IRS, who is a character, Michael Wall Street, various other things. Was he just nervous? I mean, I've never, you know, I, he, he was stammering more than I thought he would. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but... Well, because he was trying to be himself instead of... He, and think about it. Mike's been out of the business for a while. He's a successful, grown adult. Um, but he's trying to be himself rather than his gimmick, and, and he, I think he realized that he'd never tried to be himself before. And he was kind of... And also, it's late. You could tell. And everybody, he, when you're sitting there in the room, you can tell when people are drooping. Right, so when you get up there, you feel like you're going even longer than you than you would have been normally because you know people are drooping. But boy, the next thing perked him up, didn't it? What was that? <laughs> if he only had time. Oh, that's right. This perked me up. Thunderbolt Patterson, and now the people know. The people. They know what we've been talking about. In trying, you can't describe it. You have to experience it. And of course, we had heard that Thunderbolt was going to be inducted by like Marion, Ohio radio legend Scott Spears. I, and we thought, what the <laughs> fuck? Lawler wanted Lance Russell. And they said, no, nobody knows who he is. And he gets a fucking radio guy from Ohio. But they they just humored him. They had New Day uh, along with Big E, who was back with them to give uh, some element of an induction speech, and then introduced, and now accompanied by Scott Spears, here's Thunderbolt Patterson. And they, uh, T-Bolt's 82, so he's in a wheelchair. They wheeled him out, but he gets up, he can move around, but he couldn't take that long trek, right? Down to the ring, he got up, he hugged Gerald Briscoe, and hugged JBL and got back in the chair and they went to the video and now the people you see the 70s footage in the ring you see what we're talking about with the work but we're from the promo clips and then from this speech you see what we're talking about with the promo it <sighs> Thunderbolt was over with the fans in in the places that he got over he was over as a person with those people, and they believed in him as a person. And if you had heels that had a lot of heat, the Anderson brothers or whoever the fuck, people would go out of their minds to see Thunderbolt beat them up, and they would overlook a significant portion of Thunderbolt's in-ring because it, it you just had to. But it was the thing that he was doing rather than how he was doing it. And he was charismatic in the ring. You can't yes, you watch that, the clips of him in the ring, and it is you do watch him, even though he's no, unorthodox. I'm not, I'm not talking about his charisma when he's in the ring, the strutting and the dancing. I'm talking about when he actually did an offensive move to anybody. That's what you had to overlook. <laughs> Cause that looked like shit. <laughs> but everything else about him was in, it was incredible. And uh, lots of people stole stuff from the, the promos as they talked about. And you know, you see by the clips, the people are going crazy, but the heels are just bumping off of him when he, you know, looks askew in their general direction. Ah, you, ah! And that's what it was. And then, but well, before Thunderbolt got started talking, Scott Spears did indeed speak. And I'm surprised, now it was after midnight in the building, I'm surprised there weren't snipers from that crowd in Philadelphia. He called Thunderbolt Patterson the Jackie Robinson of wrestling. Yeah, well, yes. That's he a bit a of a stretch. Of... <laughs> That's a bit of a stretch. Bobo Brazil and Jim Mitchell are calling, but nevertheless. Yeah, really? Th what this was was local radio at its best. Because this is, uh, he was a local radio guy, and I'm sure he's a big wrestling fan, and he told the most confusing story that I've ever heard in my life about a, a sheriff killing his wife and <laughs> I'm about to I'm about to tell it better. A sheriff killed his wife and drew the fucking crime photo sketch of Thunderbolt to try to throw people off the trail. Uh, but it would have been a hell of a story if anybody had told it. And so then Scott got finished. If I only did crime. 
if I only did crime, or if I only had a dime. <laughs> so then, <laughs> Thunderbolt, then I could call somebody. <laughs> See, that's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was amazing. <laughs> the days of the payphone. Uh, and, and anyway, he started, Thunderbolt started his speech by praying. And suddenly it was a revival, and it was just like his wrestling promos, only nobody on wrestling television in the territory days ever let him talk for 15 minutes. And now you see what I'm talking about. It, it's complete gibberish, but an amazing performance. It, <laughs> there is no linear story or thought related or e possibly even a sentence finished. It's just blurting sound bites and random words and phrases tied together in a in a performance that's as much athletic as it is verbal with the contortions and the the oomph that he puts in it did you see what happened with his dentures at, 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 at one point he almost maybe the poly grip wasn't working like it it needed to but he managed to catch him and that's the thing is that it, you, you're you caught up in whatever the fuck this is. It's a captivating performance of something that, but you, you don't know what he's saying. He says a lot of things that sound good, but they don't really join together to form a cohesive story. And then, and I think he, it was done and he was over or it was over with. I, and then, and then he ceased talking. But that's, I'm telling you, nobody says nonsense like that anymore in the world. You can, you can make money with, they did make money with that. Because whatever he's doing, people like to watch it. Well, at one point, the uh, DJ or the, um, the local radio guy. I'm wondering. I'm wondering what their format is. He didn't look like a heavy metal kind of guy or a fucking, you know, uh, urban well, music. I have a feeling it's talk radio. I have a feeling it's talk radio. But he said, when Thunderbolt said, "If you move," <laughs> the people knew what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, and even even he even told the story wrong about if only had time. Because he I said, felt like he had, watched one of our videos about I him. Think, then, yes, I think he may have to prep for this because he he said one time when asked to go out on television and talk about his match, Thunderbolt said, "If I only had time." No, it was only saying, "Just say you're going to be in Carrollton tonight. It's a spot show. If we mention it, it draws. If we don't, nobody goes. Just say." The last 30 seconds of the show, I'll be in Carrollton tonight. I'm coming to Carrollton. Carrollton, Carrollton. That's all you got to say. And Thunderbolt got the last 30 seconds. We got to finish talking about the Omni. And then looked at the camera and said, and, mm, ah, ah, ooh, if I only had time. <laughs> and they went off the air. Well, this guy explained it. He goes, People knew. Now, when Thunderbolt said, if I only no, had time. No, they didn't know. Because they, they didn't hear the word Carrollton to know that he was going to be there in Carrollton that night. <laughs> but I, I, anyway, that, I mean, do you, you see now. I'm a fan of Thunderbolt. You ain't going to talk me out of it. I think he's the best. <laughs> I'm not saying he's bad, but it's different. It's, it's, un, it's undescribable. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. It, may, it points out, like, when you see Big E doing, like, his evangelical voice or whatever you want to call it, it feels like a guy putting on a voice. Thunderbolt, it's real. It's deep inside. This is the way he communicates. Yes. Well, no, because, I mean, there's a different... I'm not trying to uh, pigeonhole or categorize Big E's African-American experience, but I can say this with some degree of certainty, that Thunderbolt Patterson has been in many more black Southern churches in his life than Big E has been in his. And Thunderbolt sounds legitimate. He sounds exactly like the, the preaching that you would hear in the church in Georgia or in Mississippi or in the Carolinas in those, in those churches 
which is why that those audiences believed him because he sounded exactly like the preacher that was lying to him on Sunday morning. And he was the wrestler that was lying to him on Saturday afternoon. But it was the same. It was legitimate. It was authentic. And this guy's 82 years old now, and he can still talk like that. Should they give him the Ron Wright gimmick? Bring him back? Let him work TVs? No. <laughs> Managing Carrying Cross, Thunderbolt Patterson? I, I, you know, hey, nobody thought more of Ron Wright than I did, right? And do. Bless his, bless his heart. But... I wasn't going to pitch Ron for national TV because it wasn't the audience for East Tennessee. It was perfect because everybody knew somebody like him, but he was turned up all the way with it and he had the history and it made sense and it worked. But with this production right now, Thunderbolt Patterson in the wheelchair, I don't know. And, and let's face it, Ron Wright could focus on the issue and give you a promo that would get the, rest of the people involved over rather than just we got to go see Thunderbolt or we got to go see Ron. The people knew when he said, if I only had time, it meant you better come to the arena tonight. Yeah. Cause we got no more time on TV, <laughs> but we'll have more time tonight at the arena. So, it, I mean, it was, this is a, this was again, also there's been, 40 years, what is that? Two generations, as they count them, removed from when any of these people would have seen Thunderbolt live work or talk or whatever, and it had to be somewhat of a culture shock to go, what, what's going on here? Well, you know, the saddest thing is, if someone saw that and said, I wanted to see more Thunderbolt Patterson, there isn't a lot readily available. It's not like some fan could say, you know, this, this could be something that causes someone to dive off into wrestling history. Yeah, no, well, and, and the stuff, most of the promo stuff is from the mid-80s or early 80s Georgia shows that they have in the library and then the WCW Legends events or whatever. But uh, they the got only, Florida stuff, I think, and well, they've got well, Mid-Atlantic. That, that, that's, that's what I'm saying is the only, they don't have any Mid-Atlantic as old as Thunderbolt. No, I guess just 85 is all I'm thinking of. Well, no, they there might very well be some early 80s Mid-Atlantic because Crockett had kept, when they got the Nemo truck, what, 81-ish? There was a lot of stuff still around. But, but he wasn't there. He wasn't around. He wasn't there. That's why I'm trying to get to that point. Thunderbolt was not in the Carolinas past the mid-70s, and I think there's only a few things of him on the Mid-Atlantic films that I saved. But the Florida collection is what they got those clips of the action footage you see of him and Dusty, that's when Dusty was a heel before the 74 turn, that would be the only place that there would be the footage of Thunderbolt when he was really in his prime, really over on top main event guy. And I don't know that they saved the TVs. I think that's a lot of arena matches, so you wouldn't have a lot of interviews. There's where I was going. So not a lot of stuff left. He's in the limited footage. There is, um, you know, there's the film they made about the Sam Houston Coliseum and wrestling in 72, I think. He's in that, so you get to see him as a heel working for Paul Bosch. Did he work some for Einhorn in the IWA, or am I imagining things? I think he did. I'm trying to remember that intro where they would show you all the different stars. Luscious Larry Heinemey. They would show you all the different stars on there. I, uh, I think Thunderbolt... And him, too. There. All the stars and him, too. I think he may have worked there, yeah. Well, anyway, you're ready for the main event, right, of the, the Hall of Fame ceremony because we can't go home yet because the big one, the big one is left. Finally, Leah Maivia has come back to the Hall of Fame. And uh, again, nice package. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, here came the rock. Nice package manufacturing history to somehow make this a reasonable entrant into any Hall of Fame involving wrestling. <laughs> what the hell was that? It, we talked, we, we've gone over the, the details, which we will enumerate here again shortly in a briefer fashion, but Rock came out to his music, and this is where you could tell, okay, the people are tired. This was not a rock entrance. This was, here he comes again, at least it's about over. Didn't you feel like that? 
Oh, yeah, I felt like that. Yeah. Even in Philly, even with The Rock, right? This is the nicest it's, Philly audience I think ever. Well, yeah, because they're the ones that fucking took Doink down when he was a baby face. Philly are the ones who took Santa Claus down. Yeah, well, but remember, almost nobody in the building was from Philadelphia, though, because this is WrestleMania weekend. Everybody's from out of town. But anyway, he mentioned in a plethora, a pantheon of wrestling promoters' names. I think he mentioned Jim Crockett. He mentioned a variety of uh, Fritz von Erich. He mentioned Vince, and there was a smattering of disgusted murmuring in the crowd at the mention of Vince's name. Did you catch that? I caught that. And remember, even when Vince was there, you were never supposed to mention Vince. Vince. <laughs> you were never supposed to mention Vince. <laughs> Goddamn people, this is taking a toll on us too. Please <laughs> have mercy. <laughs> well, the Minch, Vin, Minch. He's a Minch, Vin, but not Vince. Vince, Vince is Vinch not a Minch. Vince was not a Minch. No, he wasn't. And a small smattering of disgust for the mention of his name but Rock almost started rambling here. And then at least he mentioned Dusty and the Rhodes family and talked to Cody and said he respects Dusty and Mama Rhodes, but Cody, you and I aren't business, it's personal. So at least he turned this into something for business. But as we mentioned, and I think it was a... <laughs> I'm not of, opposed to all of these things, any of these things happening individually, but we got rock heavy real quick. And that's me saying that his grandmother in the hall of fame, Muhammad Ali's widow, giving him a championship belt main event at WrestleMania. His daughter is now the general manager of NXT. The final boss. I love any of these things in a vacuum, but they're coming fast and furious. No pun intended. So this was, and and again, you know, the people were like, oh, I don't think they cared about Leah Maivia if they believed the story of how successful she was that was told rather than knowing the truth about how she inherited a limping business and saw it put out of its misery a few years later. And threatened anyone who came within reach. I mean, Ed Francis got threatened. Yeah. He said that the other day. They made the video all about that one show, whatever it was, 85 or 86. Hot uh, Summer Night. It was the 85, which uh, had 40 guys, including Antonio Inoki and Ric Flair from all over the world and did 15,000 people. But it was most guys going because of to honor Peter Maivia and his memory and to get a free trip to Hawaii for a couple of days. And again, you listen to the rock speech you watch that video they're saying now how they're honoring the legacy with the next generation the rock's daughter and the rock says now leah gets to join her rightful place in the hall of fame next to her husband it's too rock heavy too quick in the wrong ways this is i love the new heel rock stuff if people think i'm still ripping on his on camera on camera stuff that stuff's been mostly great although it's a little self-indulgent at times but this stuff is ridiculous. I think the problem is the business was hot. It was getting hotter. It was on a trajectory to keep getting hot. He jumped in there. He's not the cause of it. He can cause more people to get interest over a period of time. But the WWE shouldn't be centered around the rock and the rock's wants. Well, and that's one thing that I saw with the first night of WrestleMania that we will get to shortly. Um, I know you all been waiting with bated breath. He can't help even. I mean, the match was structured where a lot of the attention was on him, but you can't help but looking at this guy, even when the attention isn't on him, unless he hides under the ring. Just natural charisma, doesn't it blow everybody else away? Roman Reigns looked like a big deal until he was standing next to The Rock. I don't know if you can... Can you dull that brightness down? I'm not sure. Maybe he'll do it on his own if we see him anymore. Maybe he can come out and give a fucking concert again. Put him in there with Brock. He'll be out for two years healing up. Oh, Jesus Christ. But anyway, that, uh, that brought a conclusion to our Hall of Fame portion of the 
WrestleMania weekend festivities with um, with Paul Heyman giving a speech and then everybody else fucking boring us to tears, practically. The Rock giving himself a belt after Muhammad Ali's wife <laughs> says she's known him since she was six years old is one of the things that will always... Bl- and, the, and the Undertaker coming out there just giving... Now, that was, now, wait, now you've said it wrong there because now the way that you said it, she hasn't known The Rock since he was six. She no. knew Muhammad since he was six. That's right. We covered that earlier. And but. The Rock had a big summit with the Ali family at the Louisville Gardens to go over if he's allowed to call himself the people's champion. And all these years later, they had a belt made with WWE logos to present to him. Well, and you know, uh, you know, the, the whole, uh, the, the whole rest of the story, don't you? No. The rest of the story is during that summit meeting, uh, you know, the rock gave the Ali family the, the rights to sell the people's champion merchandise with his name on it. And they turned around and they ran straight to our friends over at Shopify and set up a global commerce platform. And they have secretly made $27,472,000 on the Rocks merchandise over the last several years. How would you know that? If they secretly made that, how would you know that? Well, because see, Shopify, the fine folks over there, they're the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. They're our sponsor. And, well, I got to talking with one of the high muckety-mucks over there, and they told me, just between him and me. Really? Yes. Interesting. That's because you don't get to speak to a lot of the high muckety-mucks over there. You just speak to the the regular fucking Kmart fucking shopper that, you know, talks to you, but I get to only talk to the CEOs and the final bosses and the people over at Shopify and all the rest of our sponsors. Who'd you talk to? You talk to Joel? Henry? Yes. Phil? Yes. Carlos? All three of them. All three of them. Joel, Henry, and Phil. All three of them. And folks, you can talk to Joel or Henry or Phil, whoever you talk to. They will tell you the same thing, that Shopify is going to make you a lot of money. They're the place you need to go. If you've got a product and you've got a service you'd like to sell on the internet, well, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify powers 10%. Of all the e-commerce in the United States of America, Shopify takes you everywhere from the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage all the way to the, did we just hit one million order stage and all the way into, oh my God, the IRS has caught us, they're cracking down, we're going to prison stage. They'll be with well, you. You'll be paying through the taxes. entire life of your business. They will disassociate if you're a criminal. You will do legal things and pay your taxes. Oh, as it. soon as you get charged with anything, they're going to disassociate you real quick. But as long as you're making money, you're part of the family with Shopify. And folks, again, they've got other, uh, 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 other, uh, 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 <laughs> they got lots of that and so much more. I can't even begin to. There are no words to describe the products that Shopify. It help you sell. Running through my mind, they've they've got other of of God damn it. <laughs> they've they even got those, ladies and gentlemen. Where else could you get such a variety? I lost the, I lost the line. <laughs> oh the God damn it's so long on the email. It's double spaced. I can't find it where I well. You can grow your average order value if I can't find where I was reading before. <laughs> And you don't have to just sell your own stuff with Shopify Collective. You can curate products to sell from the brands you love. You go into a store, you see something you like from a brand you love, you just take it. Stick it in your pocket, take it home, list it on your site, Shopify. No, don't do that. Do not do that. Obviously, don't steal, don't shoplift. Shopify magic. Shets is this is not shopliftify. What do you think? This is Shopify. There's going to be some payment going on somewhere. That's right. And they're your no excuses business partner. You can sell without needing to code or design. Just have a wild hair up your ass and some kind of harebrained idea and Shopify will take it and run with it. They'll teach you how to make money with it. And then whenever you get too big for your britches or develop a drinking problem, they'll leave you in the gutter somewhere and go on to somebody else. And with Shopify magic, you can whip up captivating content that converts from interest to sales immediately you can pick the perfect email send time generate instant fact answers make blog posts and product descriptions 
and whatever you do with them from there. And they make getting paid simple by instantly accepting every type of payment in the world. I'm talking every type of currency. You know, on some of the South Sea Islands, they accept shells as currency, Brian. You might get so you shells. might open a box one of these days, you'll get a bunch of fucking seashells from the seashore. They'll accept any type of currency, but they'll get you something. You'll get something out of this shit, no matter what. So if you want marketing made simple and Shopify to remove the guesswork with built-in tools that help you create, execute, and analyze, then all you got to do is go right now to Shopify.com because they got a $1 a month trial period. I mean, geez, even if it just sucked donkey dicks for a dollar a month, who gives a shit? Shopify.com slash JCE. That's all lowercase now, by the way. Shopify.com slash JCE for a $1 a month trial period to grow your business no matter what shape you're in or stage you're in or shape you're in or no matter what state you're in. Offer void in certain states. Shopify.com slash JCE is going to make you money.